What is going on everyone and welcome back to the channel and welcome back to another Freaky Friday. Today's story comes from r slash no sleep and it is truly phenomenal. What would you do if you were legally not allowed to sleep for 72 hours? Well, that is exactly what happens in this one. Before we get into it, please do subscribe to the channel if you haven't already done so. Click the follow button if you're listening on podcast platforms and drop a like on this one if you're excited. This is our slash no sleep. The 72 hour sleep ban. I've always associated my birthday with that depressing time of year where a cozy autumn turns into an early winter decay, where colorful leaves die, leaving a withered brown shell behind. Still, people are expected to celebrate their birthdays. It's strange if one doesn't. I don't. My fiance recently asked me why I never celebrate my birthday, and it's a hard one to explain. When you've been through something traumatic, everything sort of brings you back to that moment, one way or another. And while I'd love to tell her about it, I don't think I can without sounding like a maniac. I thought I'd start by just telling my story anonymously and sort of go from there. It was the year I turned 13. Since You've Been Gone was blasting on the radio every hour of the day. My friends and I were quoting how I met your mother religiously. It was a good time to be a kid. Since my birthday was in the middle of the school week, my big birthday plans were postponed until the upcoming weekend. Still, I couldn't complain. Birthday cake on a Tuesday didn't sound all that bad. I got home, had a small celebration with my parents and opened a few presents. Two new games for my PlayStation 2. Score. I finished up my homework and browsed the net for a few hours ahead of my scheduled bedtime when there was a knock at the door. We rarely had visitors, so to have someone knocking at our door at 10pm was unusual to say the least. My parents had already opened the door by the time I was halfway down the stairs. There was a man in a fancy jacket with a clipboard standing outside along with two armed guards. I sort of fell into the middle of the conversation. So we need you to sign the consent form and we'll get started, the clipboard man said. Any questions? This can't be legal, my mum said. On what kind of authority are you- Mum, this is an emergency. We have been authorised to bring anyone and everyone if need be, but I promise you it will be a less pleasant experience than what you could achieve here in the comfort of your own home. As the discussion continued, the armed men pushed into the house. They had a sort of checklist they were going through, asking questions as they poked and prodded. Someone mentioned a satellite phone, which we didn't have. I hurried back upstairs. From my window, I could see them putting wheel locks on our car. They were testing some sort of electrical equipment too, and as they did, I could see the internet connection on my computer disappear. My cell phone lost all bars, and while I didn't check, I suspected they'd done something to our landline as well. They were isolating us, putting us under some sort of lockdown. I still didn't have the slightest idea of who these people were. There were no patches, badges, ranks, or symbols, just a bunch of serious looking men in windbreakers with visible gun holsters. After a few minutes, one of the men entered my room. My parents were worried sick, but were told to wait outside. The man was about six foot four and had the look of someone who could kill me with his bare teeth if need be. Without a word, he started to go through my things. You got any walkie talkies? He asked. Any radio science projects? Something like that. Nope, I said, shaking my head. I got a PlayStation 2. That can go online, right? I never got the chance to answer before my mum added. We don't let him play online games, she said. It can't do that. As if to make sure, he pulled the power cable and dropped it in a sealed bag along with various knickknacks and keys they'd collected. They weren't taking any chances, and I wasn't playing my new games anytime soon, it seemed. As they finished up their impromptu house inspection, we were asked to gather downstairs. The fancy man with the clipboard cleared his throat, and the room fell deathly silent. Even my dad, who was usually a very assertive man, didn't have much to add to the conversation. That's how you knew it was serious. For 72 hours, this and surrounding neighborhoods are under lockdown, the man explained. There is a localized problem related to a recent geological event which has caused some unexpected issues. I'm sure you've noticed some minor oddities as of late. Like what? My dad asked. Well, milk turning sour, houseplants getting a strange color tint, swarms of frogs cluttering the roads. My parents said nothing, but they nodded. 
perhaps they'd seen something I hadn't. The man put down his clipboard as he explained calmly. You have been exposed to something akin to a chemical. It reacts violently to the release of certain hormones which are associated with deep REM sleep. To ensure your safety, we are currently enforcing a temporary 72 hour ban on sleep. Excuse me? My dad took a step forward, but one of the armed men responded in kind. They both stopped before it had the chance to escalate. Exposure was approximately nine hours ago, meaning you have about 63 hours left to go. That'll be approximately 1 p.m. on Friday. But there is no way we- This is non-negotiable. This is a matter of your security, sir. We have an emergency health service site, but I can promise you that it won't be pleasant. You will be chemically induced into sleeplessness for the full duration of exposure until the event has passed. It can cause long-lasting brain damage. We were handed a folder each, explaining our responsibilities and rights. An unmarked red folder with three papers. One explaining their right to force this upon us, another explaining that we'd already signed the consent papers, and a third one was a form explaining exactly when we could go to sleep. There was also an inventory form explaining the items we were to have returned at the end of the containments. They left a box of 50 glass vials, some kind of four hour booster shots. The man explained how underage children were not to take more than one every seven hours, and that my mother, if pregnant, shouldn't take any at all. Luckily, my mum wasn't pregnant. I'm an only child. We were also given fiber bars with some kind of hormone supplements. Unmarked and unbranded, but warm. Maybe they were made recently. The packaging was sloppy at best. The fancy man was trying his best to explain, and I could see my parents were eager to listen, but I barely understood half of it. Instead, I looked at the armed guards. They looked exhausted. Maybe they too weren't allowed to sleep. One of them had his mouth open and almost drooled, blinking one eye at a time. I could have sworn he nodded off for a second, which prompted him to take a walk outside. I don't know if we can do this, my mother complained. It's, it's a lot to ask. We've only just- If at any point you can't do this, you need to call this number. It's the only number that works, the man said, pointing to the final line on the final page of the folder. If someone falls asleep and can't be awakened within a few minutes, they're in terrible danger. If that happens, try to keep them awake by any means until we can get here to pick them up. And then they'll be taken to our site in Mankato, where they'll be chemically induced to stay awake. So what exactly happens if, if someone doesn't make it? My mum asked. If we all just fall asleep? The man shook his head, tapping the clipboard with his pen. They will most probably die. Others might too. While they went into the kitchen to explain the details, the angry looking guard approached me with the sealed bag, handing me back my PlayStation 2 power cable. He gave me a pat on the shoulder. I checked with the tech team, he said. You're good to go and uh, a happy birthday. I'd almost forgotten that it was my birthday. I appreciated the gesture, but I just couldn't bring myself to smile. I had too many questions bubbling in the back of my head and I was too afraid to speak. They probably talked for another 20 minutes or so before the men left, leaving my parents and I alone in the kitchen. My mother was smoking under the kitchen fan. I'd only seen her smoke two times, once when she lost her job and another time when her father got sick. Smoking in the kitchen was a surefire way to tell that something was wrong. Dad, sitting with his arms crossed, was looking at the box of booster shots. This is not a joke, my dad finally said. This is very serious. We're all gonna need to help each other to get through this. Mum said nothing, but I could see her hands trembling. She'd been crying. She was shaking so much that the ash from her cigarette didn't reach the ashtray, it just plopped down on the stove. We can't be alone, Dad continued. We're gonna do our best to keep busy. You can play as many games as you want, but you can't fall asleep. They gave back my power cable, I said. Does that mean it's okay for me to use the PlayStation? It's okay, Mum coughed. It's okay, honey. Play your games. For those first few hours, I didn't understand what the big deal was. No more school for the rest of the week, no bedtime, and unlimited screen time. That didn't sound too bad. I gained late into the night. Sly 2 and Ratchet and Clank were on the menu, and I had a blast. I got some snacks along with one of those fiber bars. They tasted like twigs and raisins, but it made my brain calm. Not tired, but it made it easier to focus. 
It also made it harder to shut my eyes, making my eyelids itch. All lights in the house were kept on all throughout the night. Mum and dad kept playing music on the downstairs stereo and they desperately tried to keep me engaged. I was engaged enough just playing games, so I think it was more for their benefit rather than mine. At 5 a.m., dad took his first booster shot. I could hear it all the way from upstairs. He was cussing pretty hard. Apparently, those things tasted like a mix of stale rice and death. Mum took her first boost about half an hour later, but she mixed it with orange juice. Apparently, that helped. By 7 a.m., even I was feeling it. I'd never been up all night playing games like that on a school day before. Sure, I pulled all-nighters with my friends, but it was usually something we prepared for. So by early morning, I could feel myself nodding off. My parents were checking in on me every now and then and decided to act. We were having family breakfast, pretending as if we'd already slept. You're always cranky in the morning, mum said. Try to imagine this is just that another cranky morning i knew for a fact that they'd slipped one of the boosters into my cereal i saw three empty vials on the counter and i knew that none of them had taken a second still i had little choice but to try we weren't even halfway through the containment yet as we finished our breakfast we could hear commotion outside i was upstairs brushing my teeth watching through the hallway window it was our neighbors larry peterson the 55 year old man who worked the fishing supplies at the local mini mall crawled out his front door he was throwing up something black and blue onto the pavement i'd never seen this man do anything more physically straining than trying to start a lawnmower and now he was crawling on all fours like his life depended on it i could hear his wife calling out from inside she was screaming at him but i couldn't hear what larry got up and almost leapt into the back of his pickup truck in a show of athleticism that i'd never seen from him before it wasn't until his wife got out of the house that I could hear what she was saying. Larry, she cried. Larry, wake up. I saw Larry Peterson grab a wrench, get out of the truck and grab his wife by the hair. Suddenly, a hand covered my eyes as my father dragged me away from the window. I could hear a scream turn into a gargle, followed by a hearty laugh, one I'd heard a thousand times before. The same kind of laugh Larry Peterson would chuckle up whenever my dad tried to pull off a bad pun. My mind painted a picture of what had happened, and it wasn't pretty. My dad spun me around and stared into my eyes. I could tell he wasn't himself. There were lines across his face that I hadn't seen before. Stay with me and mum, he said. Don't look outside. People are getting sick. Are we getting sick, dad? I asked, a yawn escaping me. He shook me a little, as if to make sure I was paying attention. We'll be fine, he said. It's just a matter of time, but I don't want you to see people getting hurt. Larry isn't feeling well. There was a knock on the front door. Dad took points as mum hid in the bedroom. I remember standing on the top of the stairs, looking over the railing to the floor below. There was a violent, angry pounding on the door. Larry Peterson's soft chuckle coming from the other side. He didn't say anything. He just pounded on the door with his wrench, laughing as he tried to get in. He went around the house, rattling our windows. He didn't get far before we could hear a car roll up. There was a popping sound, but not like a gunshot. I think they tased him. By the time I could hear Larry Peterson get dragged off, my mum had come upstairs with a smile taped to her face, asking me to show her how far I'd gotten in my fancy new video games. She was clearly trying to keep me distracted, but I didn't mind. At that point, I wanted desperately to be distracted. I could imagine Larry Peterson on the other side of the front door, his white t-shirt stained with that strange black and blue goo he'd thrown up, wielding that wrench with a manic grip. The thing was as large as my arm and solid metal. I'd never considered it a weapon, but thinking about it made my blood run cold. Had he really killed Mrs. Peterson? Why? Mum and I spent the next few hours playing video games. We also made a plan. We went through our old DVDs and decided on a watching schedule. She'd originally planned a walk, but now we weren't to leave the house. She didn't want to say why, but I had the feeling that there was something outside the Peterson's house that she didn't want me to see. Bloodstains, maybe? I was too afraid to find out. My parents tried their best to keep the mood up, 
but I could tell it was getting to them. My dad was mostly just standing there, leaning against the door, staring straight ahead like in a trance. Mum tried to occupy herself by playing games and watching DVDs with me, but she was counting the minutes until she could get her next booster shots. I wasn't eager to take one. They made my stomach all queasy. We made it all the way until noon. Dad was having trouble staying up and kept washing his head with cold water. He tried to keep busy doing housework that he'd kept for a rainy day, but there were constant distractions. We could hear sirens in the distance, and at one point there was someone spraying our front door and windows with a high pressure water hose, possibly to wash away the last traces of Larry Peterson. There were dog patrols going up and down the street, along with the occasional phone call. The one number that still worked where someone called to make sure we were all awake and accounted for. By dinner time, mum was having stomach troubles. Her shaking had gotten worse and she was having trouble with sudden change of smells. Dad kept rubbing his eyes and checking his watch, getting up every 10 minutes or so just to move around. We decided that we were going to play board games after dinner, but mum was having trouble keeping herself from throwing up. We ended up just reheating a lasagna from a few days back. I didn't mind, mum made amazing lasagna, but my appetite was quickly lost when I saw my mother barely keeping it together. She kept drooling and making this weird chugging sound. She was blinking slower and slower. Dad tried to get her to eat one of the fiber bars, but she just ran out of the kitchen, locking herself in the bathroom. It was touch and go for a while. I could feel my heart racing as dad tried to convince her to unlock the door, but she just couldn't do it. After a while, she stopped responding. Dad had to break the handle with a hammer, but it was too late. She was already sleeping. I could hear it through the door. And that is going to do it for part one of this unbelievable no sleep story. Tune in next Friday for the remainder of this one. Part two will be coming then. All I can say is so far, this has me hooked. What a story. I mean, put yourself in this position. 72 hours of being forced to stay awake or, well, who knows what happens. We're not entirely sure yet, but after seeing what happened to Larry Peterson, yeah, I don't really want to know. Guys, if you enjoyed this one, drop a like on it and comment down below if you're excited for part two. Also, make sure you are subscribed with notifications on so you get notified when part two drops next Friday. Now, if you're watching this a while after it's been published, then you're in luck. Part two may already be out. If it is, it's on the end screen right here and linked down below. But if it's not, you're going to have to wait until next Friday. See you then with part two.